रमजान जुमा मुबारक बसमिनुमा رجالاً كثيراً ونساء واتقوا الله الذي بتساءلون به والارham ان الله كان عليكم رقيبا يا ايها الذين امنوا اتقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا يصلح لكم اعمالكم ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم من يطع الله ورسوله فقد فاز فوزا عظيما all thanks and praise are due to allah we seek his help and his forgiveness and we seek refuge in allah from the evil within ourselves and the consequences of our evil deeds and whoever allah guides will never be led astray and whoever allah leads astray will never find guidance and i bear witness that there is no god but allah alone without any partners and i bear witness that muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam is his servant and his messenger o oh mankind oh we have believed fear allah speak words of appropriate justice he will amend for you your deeds forgive you your sins and whoever obeys allah and his messenger has certainly attained a great attainment amma ba My dear brothers and sisters, today we'll continue that journey that we've been on so far, and talking about the ninety-nine names of Allah. And today I want to talk about three more names: Al Wadud, Al Wajid, and Al Baith. Uh, the first name we'll talk about today is Al Wadud, and the, at the very basic, the definition is the most loving. Um, the root word for this word is Wal Dal Dal, which means love, to be affectionate, to desire, or to wish for. You know, at the end of the day. at a very instinctive level who doesn't like to be loved who doesn't want to have that feeling of love and affection from anyone and this is where allah subhanahu wa ta'ala excels amongst other things and the name the na- meaning of this name is very close to another name of allah that we talked about which is al rahman the merciful now to be merciful implies that there's a relationship between one showing mercy and one receiving mercy and this relationship exists when there's a need for someone or the need that someone has and somebody that can fulfill that need so for example a poor person in need of money homeless person in need of shelter you can show or allah shows mercy to that person but there's a prerequisite in the word mercy that there has to be some need beforehand love on the other hand alhamdulillah i mean it's just allah just has love for all of us and one way to think about it is that allah tells us uh, you will all return to allah on the day of judgment and that to me at least is another way of considering the infinite love that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and allah bestows all of his favors to all of his creations there is no limit to the favors that allah bestows to anyone and to understand that loving nature of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is what this name is for us you know we want to make sure that we understand that uh, knowledge dignity wealth and many other things that we enjoy and consume on a daily basis is something that comes from Allah Subhanahu wa ta'ala because Allah has that love and Allah represents that love as one of the attributes that Allah has described uh, for himself you know so like all names of Allah Subhanahu wa ta'ala that we've talked about so far you know what is our share in this how can we somehow associate what we do with this love and and the way to think about this is is the old maxim uh, you know treat others like you would be like to be treated or do unto others that which you would like done to you and this action of desiring for others what you would want for yourself is within the spirit of this love that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has for all of us so to love someone for the sake of allah is a righteous act that is beloved to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in sahih al bukhari we find that the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said whoever possesses the following three qualities will taste the sweetness of faith one the one to whom allah and his apostle become dearer than anything else two the one who loves a person only for allah's sake and the one who hates number three the one who hates to revert to disbelief which such as atheism after allah has brought uh, him or her out from that so that he or she hates to be thrown back into the fire so to love allah's creation for the sake of allah is not just emulating al wadud it's also one of the ingredients to enjoying a richer experience with our faith in allah subhanahu wa ta'ala 
you know, just like an athlete who practices their sport, builds that muscle memory, you know, by doing very specific exercises for that sport. We have a similar connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as, as part of that effort, you know, maintaining consistency with our connection with Allah, you know, is, is work that we need to put in. And we can look to the Quran for pretty much anything, you know, as far as guidance goes, because that's where Allah's words live. That's where we find the words that Allah has given to us or shared with us. Uh, one of the verses uh, in the Quran that talks about this righteousness is in Surah Al-Baqarah, verse 177. Uh, and I'm just going to quote this. Righteousness is not in turning your faces towards the east or the west. Rather, the righteous are those who believe in Allah, the last day, the angels, the books, and the prophets, who give charity out of their cherished wealth to relatives, orphans, the poor, needy, travelers, beggars, and for freeing captives, who establish prayer, pay alms tax, and keep the pledges they make, and who are patient in times of suffering, adversity, and in the heat of battle. It is they who are true in faith, and it is they who are mindful of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And again, you can find this in Surah Al-Baqarah, verse 177. And this is, to me, this verse is like the recipe for every believer who is striving to be close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It describes the action that one has to take, the characteristics that one has to adopt, uh, in order to connect with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, for example, one of the five pillars of Islam is salah. Five times a day, we stop what we're doing, we engage with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and remind ourselves that we will all return to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that's like building that muscle memory, that connection with Allah uh, constantly. So, inshallah, may all, may all of us be able to pray our salah on time, be able to connect with Allah in a timely manner, and just forget about the world for a few minutes and just completely focus and get consumed by our, our salam. Second name I want to talk to, uh, discuss with you today is Al-Majid. Uh, the meaning of Al-Majid is the all-glorious. The root words for Majid are, uh, the root word is Meem, Jim, Dal, or Majd, which has the meaning of glorious, dignified, uh, to be majestic, noble, exalted. And Allah is the one who is noble in essence, in actions, bountiful in gifts and favors. And glorious in this case is really just an adjective. You know, it intensifies. If I, if I look at this from the lens of an English, from the English language, it intensifies the qualities of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And there's similar attributes um, that we've talked about in the past, you know, like Al-Jalil, the majestic, or Al-Wahhab, the bestower, or Al-Kareem, the generous. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also describes the Quran as Majid. So for example, in Surah Al-Buruj, verse 21, we are told, Bal huwa Quranu Majid. In fact, this is a glorious Quran. So Allah is expressing to us that Allah is glorious and the words that Allah has given to us is also glorious. And the same thing can also be found in Surah Kaf. In the first opening verse, we see Kaf, wal Quran al Majid. Kaf by the glorious Quran. Now, as the name Al Majid intensifies other attributes of Allah, by extension, the words given to us from Allah share this intensification. And as we approach the month of Ramadan, you know, I remind myself and inshallah, you know, hopefully you, you all will be reminded that we should take this as a reminder to reconnect with the Quran as well. We cannot expect to connect with Allah if we don't try to understand that which Allah has given to us in the Quran. So inshallah, a reminder to myself first and, and foremost. Um, that also brings me to the point about language. You know, the Arabic language is not necessarily native to all of us. And even if you are a native Arabic speaker, the language used in the Quran, the Fusha Arabic, may not necessarily be easily understood either, um, you know, given the time in which that language was used versus today in which Arabic is spoken. So to benefit from this, it's important for us to not just recite it in Arabic if we're able to, but also comprehend what Allah is saying in Arabic in the language that is most familiar to us. So for me, for example, it's the English language. So if there's a language that's familiar to you, inshallah, you know, study the Quran in that language and hopefully reflect on it as well. And if we don't put that effort to understand, then it's not that easy to understand, uh, you know, wh what it means to be Muslim. Why do we say we're Muslim? Is it just in name or do we actually um, believe and follow what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has, has informed us about? And that's the glory of Allah and that's the glory of the Quran, uh, alhamdulillah. And this is affirmed to us, you know, also in the Quran. We have surely revealed to you a book in which there is glory for you. Will you not then understand? 
And this is another thing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala constantly reminds us about in the Quran is that spend the time to understand the Quran. It's not just, hey, take the word of uh, the scholar and that's your intermediary or take what you will from this and, and that's that. You have to apply some level of intellect to it. And that's one of the differentiators uh, that Allah wants us to understand in the Quran is that we have to apply our own reasoning as well in that. So the last thing I want to talk about today is al baith the raiser of the dead. The root word for this name is ba, ain, and tha, which means to call forth, to awaken from sleep or death or to resurrect. This attribute is a reference to the Lord of the Day of Judgment or Maliki Yom Din, And where there is a master of the Day of Judgment, there has to exist a day of judgment. And on this day, each soul will know what it used to say, what it used to do. And this is a part of our Akidah, our belief system. How do we know this? We're told about this also in the Quran, in Surah Al-Baqarah, verse 285. And I'm just going to quote this directly. The messenger firmly believes in what has been revealed to him from his Lord. And so do the believers. They all believe in Allah, his angels, his books, and his messengers. They proclaim we make no distinction between any of his messengers, and they say we hear and obey. We seek your forgiveness, our Lord, and to you alone is the final return. And again, this is in Surah Al-Baqarah, verse 285. We cannot call ourselves Muslims if we do not believe in the day of judgment. That's one of the uh, pillars. That's one of the, well, not, not the pillars, but one of the beliefs within our, so part of our Akidah is that we believe in the day of judgment. And the day we will all be resurrected to help to account for our deeds. So my deeds or misdeeds will not be something you would have to worry about, but it's for me to worry about. And that's what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is reminding us, that this is the day when the dead will be brought to life and told us uh, and, and, and told about what we used to do in this world. Uh, and, you know, life after death, and that's another, you know, whole other topic on its own. But, you know, Allah tells us that there is going to be life after that. You know, in Surah Al-Hajj, Allah tells us, He alone gives life to the dead, and he alone is the most capable of everything. And this verse that I just quoted in Surah Al-Hajj, verse number six, the verse before this verse, Allah addresses those who are in doubt of the day of judgment. And Allah tells us, O humanity, if you are in doubt about the resurrection, then know that we did create you from dust, then from a sperm drop, then developed you into a clinging clot of blood, then a lump of flesh, fully formed or unformed, in order to demonstrate our power to you. Then we settle whatever embryo we will in the womb for an appointed term, then bring you forth as infants so that you may reach your prime. Some of you may die young, while others are left to reach the most feeble stage of life so that they may know nothing after having known much. And the feeble stage of life um, from this verse and Surah Al-Hajj verse number five is talking about old age. So some of us will make it to an older age. Some of us may die very young. And Allah is telling us that, um, you know, all of this is, is part of that journey. Um, one of the things that I took away from this also is that Allah is trying to dispel this myth that, you know, when you die, that's it. It ends. It, it continues. There is a different form that we will take after this. Uh, and even in this verse, Allah is talking, making reference to, you know, Adam alayhi salam, when he says, we did create you from dust, but inna khalaknaku min turab. And then later from a sperm drop and continuing life of humans on earth. Then Allah continues to describe the various stages of life from the lump of flesh to fully formed, unformed fetuses to when, you know, we will grow into um, young people in old age and so on. And if there was any doubt about Allah's ability to bring life back, on the day of judgment, this verse should hopefully, you know, remove that doubt from our hearts uh, for those who question the day of resurrection. And then, you know, whatever our experience, you know, we, whatever we know from our experience, you know, uh, we tend to believe that more than anything else. And death is one of those things, you know, unless you experience it, you don't know what it's like. And unfortunately, once you experience it, there's, there's no coming back and telling about it. Um, you know, we see this all around us. Uh, you know, we, we hear terms like or acronyms like YOLO and FOMO, and, and those acronyms are driving this illusion, or at least without spelling it out, making reference to those illusions. So inshallah, may Allah protect us from, from narratives like that. And if we look at Surah Al-Mu'min, verse 14, Allah describes 
each state of transformation before uh, we are born. And what's interesting about this verse is that, you know, Allah, uh, so Allah describes the same thing that we just talked about, which is a, the sperm and the clot and so on. Um, but Allah goes and describes it with using the word khalaq. So in this verse, in this particular verse where Allah is telling about uh, the same process, Allah is using the word khalaq to describe the different things. So for example, the, the direct translation of this verse is, then we develop the drop into a clinging clot of blood, then develop the clot into a lump of flesh, then develop the lump into bones, then clothe the bones with flesh, then we brought into it being as a new creation. So blessed is Allah, the best of creators. But Allah is talking about this in, in terms of creation. So Allah talks about, for example, thumma khalakna, thumma khalakna then we created the, the, the semen drop. Then we created the clinging substance to an embryonic lump until towards the end of the verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, Thumma and Sha'nahu Khalakan Akhara. Then we produced it as another creation, meaning the final form of the infant uh, has been reached. So we tend to describe growth from a single cell organism to you know a, a, an, an embryo to uh, this human being that comes at the end the way of stages so if we think of this from the perspective of the science that we know about you know it talks about in different stages of growth what's interesting to me at least is that in the quran Allah is talking about in this terms of creation so each one of these stages is as if it's a brand new creation uh, which is an interesting perspective considering that uh, if we play this forward uh, into, you know, once you, once you have a healthy baby, you have an infant that grows, the infant at that point is, is do, dealing with nothing but emotion at that point. But at some point that child is going to grow up and say, now they have the ability to discern between things. You know, they know what's, what to do, what not to do. You have a little bit of impulse control at some point. And that ability to discern between things could be thought of as a brand new creation. You know, that exists, that didn't exist in the child until that, that age was reached. And then as this person grows up even, even more, then you have um, you know, other abilities. For example, reasoning comes into play. Reasoning didn't exist until a specific age, usually around you know, 14, 15 and so on is when you start having that ability to reason and that forms more complex thought and so on. But that was absent in us until that stage in life. And then you continue to play that forward and you, you say, okay, now, I don't know anything about prophethood, but until you were chosen by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you would then not understand what prophethood really means and the responsibilities. So all of these Allah is basically saying, you know, you have to understand that creation comes in many different, uh, many different ways. Uh, you know, and, and this is a reminder to us that all of this knowledge, all of this learning that we do over time is ultimately, you know, going to be of no use to us at some point when we die, or at least in this world, it wouldn't be of any use to us. Uh, and there's constant reminders about this in the Quran, about, you know, death and um, the day of judgment and so on. In Surah Al-Waqiyah, for example, verses 60 to 62, Allah says, we have ordained death for all of you, and we cannot be prevented from transforming and recreating you in forms unknown to you. You already know how you were first created. Will you, now, will you not then be mindful? So you can find this in Surah Al-Waqiyah, uh, verses 60 to 62. So again, hard for us to understand. Uh, these things until we've actually experienced it. And Allah is telling us that, you know, you might imagine life after on the day of judgment as being similar to the current state, but we don't actually know that. And Allah is telling us it's unknown to you. And that's part of our belief is that Allah has that ability, whether it's exactly the same or not, that's, you know, something for us to find out on that day. Um, for those who doubt in the day of judgment and, and, you know, the constant reminders in the Quran, at least, uh, as I was reviewing uh, about this, this name of Allah SWT and thinking about it, it makes me wonder, you know, this is one of those traps that shaitan throws in our way, you know, the doubt in our heart. Um, what, why are you doing what you're doing today? What will that lead to? You know, that it's okay, keep doing that. You know, Allah is most merciful, most forgiving, so you continue to do that thing that you were not supposed to do. And that's part of, you know, what we need to make ourselves aware about is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to hold us to account. And we should always go back to the source if there's ever a question about 
how we should act, how we should behave. And, and you know, our beloved Prophet Sallallahu informed us about the people who will receive protection from Allah on the day of judgment. In Sahih Muslim, for example, um, Abu Huraira was recorded as mentioning that the Prophet Sallallahu uh, said, seven are the persons whom Allah would give protection with his shade on the day when there's no shade, but that of him, that is Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. And the seven are a just ruler, a youth who grew up with the worship of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, a person whose heart is attached to the mosque, two persons who love and meet each other and depart for, uh, from each other for the sake of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, a man whom a beautiful woman of high rank seduces, but he rejects her offer by saying, I fear Allah, a person who gives charity and conceals it to an extent such that the right hand doesn't know what the left hand has given. And last but not least, the person who remembered Allah in privacy and his eyes shed tears. Uh, inshallah, may Allah make us from one of these seven people and may we always find it in our heart to connect with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so that we may learn and we may become better ourselves. I seek forgiveness from Allah for me and for you and to the rest of the Muslims. So I ask him, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, for forgiveness. And he's the forgiver, the most merciful. Let us pray, my dear brothers and sisters, inshallah. May Allah always guide us and keep us on the straight path. Rabbana hablana min azwajina wa zuriyatina kurata ayyunim wa jalna lil muttikina imama. Rabbana faqfir lana zunubuna wa kafir anna sayyatina wa tuwafana ma'ala brar. Rabbi ja'alni mukim wa salati wa min zuriyati. Rabbana wa taqabal dua. Rabbana khfirli wa li walidi wa lil mu'minina. يوم يقوم الحساب ربنا لا تزغ قلوبنا بعد إذ هديتنا وهب لنا من لدنك رحمة إنك أنت الوهاب ربنا عليك توكلنا إليك وأنبنا وإليك المصير ربنا لا تجعلنا فتنة للذين كفروا واغفر لنا وربنا إنك أنت العزيز الحكيم ربنا ظلمنا أنفسنا وإن لم تغفر لنا وترحمنا لنكونن من الخاسرين إن الله يأمر بالعدل والإحسان وإيتاء ذي القربى وينهى عن الفشاء والمنكر والبغي يعزكم لذكر ولعلكم تذكرون Ameen, inshallah, may Allah uh, give you a blessed Jummah and inshallah, hope to see you again soon. Ameen.